Ah, All right, so we're up to just about 60 here. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Hello. Uh, my name is Dr. Matthew Cooner. I'm the academic dean here at St. Bernard's School of Theology and Ministry, also assistant professor of systematic theology. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, this evening. But I'm going to mute some more people that are coming in. So if you all could just mute yourselves, I'll try to mute people as they come in, and we'll we'll do our best here. And I don't know, Bernadette and Dr. Lachlan, you guys are co-hosts. I don't know if you can also mute, but if you can, feel free uh, to hop in there and, and do that. Um, so, okay, so it's a great time. This is a special moment for us. This is our first ever Words with Wine uh, event. And obviously, in light of COVID, this sort of takes on a special significance because we can't do our in-person meetings. So this was something we thought up. Um, and we put quite a bit of thought into, so we're really grateful for you to join us, uh, joining us this evening. Uh, we did put some thought also into the title. Uh, you should know we did think of naming this Whining with Words instead of Words with Wine, uh, but I think we wisely chose to go with uh, Words with Wine, so it's pretty wonderful. Now, if this were a uh, longer, perhaps, and also a smaller event, we would certainly have people introduce themselves. Uh, but unfortunately, that would take just too much time. So in lieu of that, I wanted to say that we do have 150 registrants. We'll see if we get to that number. Some people might just not be able to make it for whatever reason. But we do have a huge number of states represented. So we have Arizona, California. The majority are from California, New York. We've got Colorado, Florida, Maryland, Maine, Missouri, uh, Minnesota, New Jersey, Nevada, and yeah, so Washington State, Virginia, Texas, Oregon, Oklahoma, Ohio. We also have someone from Chile, and I think also, if I'm not mistaken, Sweden. So we have, we have quite a, an amazing uh, mix here of people coming. So uh, thank you so much uh, for, for joining. This is wonderful. Okay, so let me ask at the outset, can everyone hear me okay? Is it good so far? Excellent, excellent. If you have any problems with Zoom, I know there was a... a, a an email sent to you. If you have any problems with Zoom whatsoever, you can just email my email address and we're monitoring that and we can kind of help you with any issues that you're having. Uh, I'm going to be sharing the screen pretty much the whole time uh, when people are presenting. And so what you can do is under, um, there should be a selection on Zoom. It should say options uh, someplace on like a floating bar and you can actually select side by side view. And so you can actually see both the shared screen and other people's faces. Um, especially the speaker, which will in large part be myself. So you should be able to uh, do that for yourself. Um, and my video is spotlighted. So hopefully whenever I'm speaking, it should be pretty straightforward that it, it kind of uh, privileges my, my screen. So it's a miracle when technology works and we're sort of hoping for an all around miracle tonight. So. Okay, so to help us uh, get a little structure and just a prospectus for the meeting, why don't we go um, to the shared screen here and I just want to show you the agenda for the evening uh, in the Prezi presentation here. So the agenda would be this. So 730, we pushed it back a little bit just to let people come in. Welcome, prayer, and going over the agenda. And we'll do prayer in just a minute here. Then in a few minutes, I'm just going to do a presentation uh, myself with regard to St. Bernard's School of Theology and Ministry. Tell you a little bit about who we are, where we're coming from, uh, how this idea, uh, you know, kind of spawned. And then we're going to hear from Brother Lewis from the Abbey of New Clairvaux and also Amy from New Clairvaux Vineyards. They work as a great team and they'll be saying a little bit about their wine as co-sponsors of this event. Uh, I'm drinking it right now, it's delicious. I, I can't recommend it strongly enough. And then we'll kind of jump into a little background on who Flannery O'Connor is, right? Who is she? And then we'll, we'll move into the discussion actually of the text that we all read, which should be extremely, extremely interesting and I'm looking forward to it. So, and then of course we'll conclude and you're all cordially invited to the next Words with Wine on Thursday, June 18th, which will actually not be um, solely a text next time. Our own president, Dr. Stephen Lachlan, is actually gonna do a Words with Wine based around a musical piece as well, or a couple different musical pieces. So that should be really, really interesting. So you don't wanna miss out on that. Um, so that's our agenda. So let's start with a prayer now. Let me, uh, let me just start with a prayer actually from Flannery O'Connor's prayer journal. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with her, but her prayer journal was one of the most recent things that came out. I'm not exactly sure how they put together, put it together and published it, but it's a collection of amazing prayers. Uh, they're, they're not your sort of um, typical prayers. They're not very formalized, but it's just sort of her journaling as it were, just speaking to God freely. And they're just tremendously beautiful. So why don't we begin with that, if that sounds good. 
from the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear God, I cannot love you the way I want to. You are the slim crescent of a moon that I see, and myself is the earth's shadow that keeps me from seeing all the moon. The crescent is very beautiful, and perhaps that is all one like I am should or could see. But what I am afraid of, dear God, is that my self-shadow will grow so large that it blocks the whole moon, and that I will judge myself by the shadow that is nothing. I do not know you, God, because I am in the way. Please help me to push myself aside. From the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Her prayers have the same cutting character as her fiction. So it's, it's sort of a, a, a fitting kind of congruence. So I want to take just a quick minute and give a little bit of background on this event. Uh, we're clearly living in unprecedented and unsettling times. And at St. Bernard's, we love to host live events. That's something that we do. Uh, we, we generate meaningful discussion and God willing, meaningful community. And so it breaks our hearts that we can't do that in our usual format. So in trying to think through how to um, generate that kind of community in this context, we happened upon this idea where hopefully we can generate those things, right? Meaningful discussion and engagement. And perhaps it's that type of meaningful engagement that we need now more than ever. Uh, we're threatened by this virus that we can't see, and it has a certain kind of power over us that's real. And yet without downplaying that power, uh, perhaps this is also the time to remind ourselves of who we are and who God made us to be. Perhaps this is a time more than ever to keep calm and to be human. And it just so happens that two of the most distinctively human things in the world are words and wine. Words represent our ability to express ourselves, to communicate the elaborate thoughts of our intellectual nature, and to give and receive love to one another and from one another. Wine represents our ability to work with nature, not to destroy it, but to apply our intelligence and our work to bring nature to ends that it could never conceive of on its own. And so as good as simple grape juice is, uh, you know, the incredible process of winemaking from grape to glass brings in an unexpected enjoyment. So these two things, words and wine, represent perhaps the height of what it means to be human. Herein lays the dignity and nobility of our nature. And as a crown of this dignity, as it were, it's no mistake that when God became man and chose to dwell with us, he took human nature upon himself and used words and wine uh, as essential aspects of his mission. So he described himself not just as the son of the father, but also the word of the father, which means that all of the particular words that he spoke on earth were the words of the word. And his changing of water into wine presaged this changing of wine into his own blood. And so he still communicates with us today through words and wine, particularly in the liturgy, the sacrament of the mass. Another unique combination in human culture of words and wine occurs during the toast. And so now I wanna ask, having prayed to our Lord, uh, I wanna ask all of us to raise our glasses if we have them and we'll begin with the toast. And maybe we can toast to all the great gifts of God particularly those gifts that represent the highest in our common life as human persons, as we're made in the image and likeness of God. And we toast especially those who are struggling under the weight of the coronavirus in any sense as we speak tonight. So may the Lord bring us all to a greater appreciation of our purpose and our dignity, more strength in turning away from sin and greater growth in love, the beating heart of all the virtues. Prost, slancha, drink well. Okay, on to more boring matters. Introductions of the co-sponsors. Okay, so first things first. Um, co-sponsors for Words with Wine, St. Bernard's School of Theology and Ministry. Here's just a few facts about who St. Bernard's is, what we do. Uh, we're located in upstate New York, roughly an hour and 45 minutes from the Canadian border. Our president is Canadian, so he forced me to put that in there. Uh, it's very important to him. We started as a Catholic seminary back in 1893, so we've got a bit of longevity. Uh, we also, uh, we were sort of Fulton Sheen's own seminary, the only seminary that he directly oversaw. So if you're a Fulton Sheen fan, uh, St. Bernard's has some traction there. And we also have an ongoing partnership for some years now with the Abbey of the Genesee, which is a Trappist Abbey 
not in California, uh, our weather is not nearly as good, uh, but in upstate New York right here. And instead of making wine, they make bread. So we have a very close partnership. We do some courses uh, in league with them. So we provide theological formation for lay students, clergy, permanent deacons. And just last year, we started to offer the Master of Arts in Catholic Philosophy, which functions as a kind of state-of-the-art pre-seminary program, um, also in an attempt to sort of do things a little bit differently than uh, seminary formation is usually done. Um, and that's in, in uh, teamwork and in collaboration with the Diocese of Albany in upstate New York. So in the fall, we're launching some certification programs uh, and continuing education programs. So, and essentially this is an attempt to open up our courses and our coursework to everyone, even those without a BA, um, even those uh, who perhaps are not interested in a graduate degree, but who just want to gather some information here and there or some formation here and there. Um, all of our courses for our master's degrees and, and all of our programs are online, including all of our live events, God willing, when things open back up. Um, and really the, the spirit of our institution is that we're out not just to provide information, but a true formation where we kind of have a synthesis of the human, right, the spiritual, the pastoral, and the intellectual. So, and, and we also try to unify spirituality and theology as well. So that's a bit of, of who we are, and we hope that this won't be the last event that you do with us uh, into the future. So at this point, I think what I'll do is actually ask uh, New Clairvaux Vineyard, Brother Lewis and Amy, if you guys are there, if you guys want to unmute yourselves and essentially do a little introduction for yourselves as our co-sponsors. We're, we're thrilled to be working with them. Um, they, they sent me the wines behind, and I've been sampling them. They're absolutely delicious. So thank you guys for teaming up with us, and we'll hear a little bit about what you guys do as well. Fabulous to be here. Thank you so much, Matthew, for, uh, for uh, having us. It's, it's quite exciting, my first time on this uh, type of platform. And my brothers are honored that uh, you would include us uh, in this event. Thank you. Yes, everyone, this is Amy. Um, just want to thank you guys for including us. Um, I'm the winemaker and work closely with the brothers and Brother Luis. Did you guys hear that? I don't know if no. I was unmuted. Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking to myself. Um, I'm Amy. Uh, oh, nice. I work with Brother Lewis and um, the brothers at New Clairvaux. Um, I help make the wine. And um, I'll let Luis uh, talk about uh, New Clairvaux if you want to do that. Yeah, am I coming through? Yes. Clear. Okay, okay, great, great. Well, yes, uh, I'm, I'm Brother Luis, I'm one of the 16 community members at the Abbey of Our Lady of New Clairvaux here in uh, sunny Vina, California. And uh, it's an honor for us to be a part of this, uh, uh, this beautiful discussion. Um, and uh, like, uh, well, uh, we're a community of 16 brothers, uh, 16 monks here. And uh, as you all know, we, uh, we live a monastic life, a Trappist Cistercian life, much like, exactly like the brothers at Genesee in New York. Uh, and uh, we do have a different industry, uh, obviously. We, we have a vineyard and we make uh, some, some wine that you've already uh, plugged for us. Thank you very much, Matthew. Very kind words. Uh, and, uh, and yes, so we're, we're here to share anything that... Uh, you might be interested in with regard to monastic life or, or the vineyards. So you can see a little more information about New Clairvaux there. Um, and we do have a video as well. I was hoping that we could show uh, if that sounds good. So yeah, let me just head over there if I can. Here we go. Oh, hold on. Is that donging coming through? <laughs> Sound good? the Abbey of New Clairvaux, there is a quiet rhythm that moves through each day. 
Bells mark time for prayer, reading, and labor, and provide the cadence for a spiritual life that has survived for nearly 1,700 years. Today, the monks of New Clairvaux have become a symbol for the revival of ancient and sacred traditions. They are men centered in God, living a truth that in a world of noise, confusion, and conflict, it is necessary that there be a place of inner discipline and peace. But the facilities of New Clairvaux have outlived their useful life. While rich in history, they are woefully outdated and unable to support the monk's vision for a spiritually thriving community devoted to sharing their close relationship with God. Yes, thank you. Really well done. Really well done. Anything you want to add, brother? Well, it, it's uh, again, it's it's our great delight to be a part of this. Uh, we don't usually have this type of outreach to uh, the greater world. Our uh, outreach is mostly on a spiritual level, on the spiritual plane. Uh, I love how uh, Flannery O'Connor's uh, uh, thoughts on the Christian mystery expanded uh, the author's view, not narrowed it. And I think uh, on the spiritual level, the monastic vocation in the cloister expands uh, our reach, not narrows it. But this is a unique way of reaching out in a different way for us uh, on Zoom. So my brothers are very excited that we have this opportunity to continue to witness to our, our charism, uh, the gift that the church gives us to uh, effect spiritual change through God's grace in a very different way, a cloistered life, a monastic contemplative uh, gift. Beautiful, thank you so much, thank you. And we will, so I think what we'll do is we'll send all registrants uh, the website for both the Abbey and then uh, Nuclear Vote Vineyards as well. So people exactly. can check out more uh, through that. So awesome. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for being here and supplying me with this wonderful wine. Flannery O'Connor pairs really well with wine. Um, it helps you get loose uh, to be receptive to <laughs> the impact of her writing. Um, so why don't we go there now? Okay, so let's go to this question of who is Flannery O'Connor and sort of dig in, right? In some ways, you guys know her well, regardless of what kind of encounter you've had previously, because you've actually read her work, and that's sort of her, her primary thing, right? She wants, she wants to be known through her work and not necessarily as a kind of biographical uh, fascination. Uh, but nevertheless, it's good to know some things about her. Okay, and so it, it's an honor because Flannery O'Connor, she means a lot to me as an author, um, both because I very much enjoy her works, uh, but also because I'm continually and deeply challenged by them. Okay, so that, that's sort of huge. They move me to laughter, to angst, uh, to joy, to sadness all at once in, in, in many ways. And I can never really read multiple stories back to back. You can only really read one, put it down. It's like a strong cigar. You know, you can't, you can't do more than one. Um, so they require a kind of gestation in the soul, as it were. Uh, at least that's my experience. So, and I also have the privilege of teaching a good bit of Flannery in a course that I teach at St. Bernard's called Faith, Fiction, and Film. And we read, I think last time I taught it, we read three short stories uh, by her. This was certainly one of them. And so if, I guess what I would say is if you are at all perplexed by her, if you're all attracted, at all attracted by what she's written, um, or if you actually hated what you read, uh, you know, feel free, the class, we have a lot more time to go into the details here. So if you're interested, it would be wonderful to have you as an auditor or a registrant. Uh, you know, we, we will only be able to scratch the surface tonight of who Flannery is and what her work means to the world and, and to our, our respective regions in America. Um, Oh, by the way, in the course, we also read Dostoevsky. We also read uh, Yerges Bernanos. And we also watch some amazing films as well. I think this time around, so that's, that'll be this fall that I'm offering it. I think we're going to watch that new film, uh, A Hidden Life, about um, Franz Jagerstadter, the, the Catholic pacifist under the Nazi regime. That new film by Terrence Malick, which is wonderful. 
Okay, so um, first a bit of background on who Flannery was. So let's, let's dive in here. Here's a couple pictures, uh, a couple photographs. Both of these are Flannery at different ages in front of her own self-portrait. Okay, that was her own self-portrait that she painted, which is a wonderful, wonderful self-portrait. Uh, Ralph Wood, who's one of my favorite scholars in Flannery, he, he juxtaposes that portrait with the Christus Pentocrator, I think on Mount Sinai, you know, the one where Christ's face is sort of divided into two different uh, emotive uh, manifestations. And there's a lot of similarities there, you know, between the two. Uh, but she's holding a peacock because she was a huge fan of peafowl. She raised peafowl, both male peacocks and female uh, peacocks, and she loved them. She, she was particularly drawn to the fact that, um, yes, they would uh, elevate their feathers for mating purposes and things like that, but then sometimes they would just do it seemingly for the glory of God, that there was no other reason except the peacock just felt like it, and, and giving glory to God with the beauty of those peacock feathers. Uh, one of my mentors in my PhD program knew Flannery. He was, he was very old and actually Flannery had given him one of her peacock's feathers. So it was kind of a neat, a neat connection. She, she adored these birds. Um, so uh, let's move on to the next one. Ralph Wood of Baylor uh, said that she is the greatest Christian writer this nation has produced. And that's quite a claim when you think about all the other Christian writers fiction writers, short story writers, novelists that this nation has produced. Um, but he says he hasn't found anyone to argue out of it. The biggest one that people put forward is T.S. Eliot. If, if you love him, I, I love Eliot, but he also fled America, um, as it were. So whereas uh, Flannery, she, she loved being here, uh, particularly in the South. And so she paradoxically was a Southerner and a devout Catholic. Um, as you know, that's not a common combination um, in the South, at least historically. And so that was a tension that she lived. She lived out very uh, interestingly. She was born in Savannah, Georgia. She lived in Iowa. She was part of the writer's workshop at the University of Iowa. And then she uh, lived in Connecticut. And she actually spent some time in Saratoga Springs for all of us uh, New York Staters at, a, at a, a kind of artistic village there. And then she died at Milledgeville, Georgia. Um, she was diagnosed with lupus in 1952 and died at the tragically young age of 39, um, as, as some people say, in the height of her powers. So we don't have a lot of work from her, actually, depending on, I mean, she probably would have produced a lot more down the road. So I have some pictures here. Uh, the, the picture at the top center is Flannery O'Connor's childhood home. That's where she was uh, born and raised in Savannah, Georgia. The picture to the bottom left is the square. Essentially, if you're standing on her stairs there to go up to the front of her house, that, that beautiful open green space square is what you would see looking out. It's tremendous. And on the opposite side of that square from her house is the top right picture, the Cathedral of uh, St. John the Baptist, I believe, which is one of the most tremendous cathedrals, I think, in the country. Um, in the bottom, at the bottom center, you'll see Marianne Cleary, who's a student of mine, uh, who took faith fiction and film, was so enamored by Flannery, couldn't get away from her. She actually took a pilgrimage to go to Milledgeville in Savannah uh, to see Flannery's life. Uh, she was just so smitten uh, by her. And I think she, sh she might be on here tonight. Uh, so thank you, Marianne, for the pictures that you sent. And then all the other pictures of sort of the Flannery paraphernalia, that's from a local small bookstore right in Savannah, a, a stone's throw away from her childhood home. And I was in there once and just was so enamored by all of this and uh, had to take these pictures and, and I'll remember it uh, forever since. Uh, there's a great quote from her I just thought I'd throw in here. The artist penetrates the concrete world in order to find at its depths the image of its source, the image of ultimate reality. Okay, so artistic work for her is a clear mission. Um, she authored two novels, Wise Blood and The Violent Bear It Away and 31 short stories. Um, so wonderful stuff. Okay, great. And you see her there with her peacocks, uh, which is so wonderful. And of course she's in braces uh, so that she um, can deal with her lupus. I think she was sick for, I mean, well, what, what was it? It probably was 12 years that she suffered um, with lupus. Okay. Oh no, sorry. Okay, so what I want to do now is just go over three short points, just as kind of an introductory thing, three characteristics of her work in reference to her faith, okay, in reference to her faith. And that's, and that's sort of um, the, the kind of thrust of tonight is, is looking at her work in reference to faith in God, 
Okay. So these are certain points that come out, especially in her prose. She wrote, she has a collection of essays called uh, Mystery and Manners. And this is probably one of the best collection of essays you'll ever read, uh, particularly from a fiction, a novel and short story writer. It's, it's just phenomenal. And a lot of these deal with her faith and her mission as a writer. So the first principle for Flannery is this. Being a Catholic does not restrict the artist's field of vision, but expands it. Okay, so here's a couple quotes from her. The Catholic writer, insofar as he has the mind of the church, will feel life from the standpoint of the central Christian mystery, that it has for all its horror been found by God to be worth dying for, but this should enlarge, not narrow, his field of vision. The chief difference between the novelist who is an Orthodox Christian and the novelist who is merely a naturalist is that the Christian lives in a larger universe. He believes that the natural world contains the supernatural. And this does not mean that his obligation to portray the natural is less, it means it's greater. Now, uh, what's operating in the background here is that many people think that being a Catholic or a Christian sort of inhibits your vision, right? It, it means that you're uh, brainwashed or, or snickerdoodled by uh, religious farce, okay? But for fat Flannery, as these quotes suggest, um, everyone's vision is shaped either by belief in God or belief in something else, right? Be it the absence of God or whatever it might be. Um, and so it's not as if it's only the Christian believer who has his worldview shaped by belief. It's every human person, every human person, whether that be belief in evolutionary mechanism or belief in evolutionary mechanism and God, right? And the supernatural, so on and so forth. So the real question then is not whether your field of view or your perspective is colored by belief. The question is which belief and is that belief real or true, right? So for Flannery, the supernatural reality of the world, the, the realness of the supernatural uh, dimension of life is as it were the most real, right? This is the very mystery of reality is that it's permeated by the supernatural. And so as the German saying goes, right? He who sees more actually has more truth. So for Flannery, being a Catholic actually expands her vision and, and honestly makes her a better writer. That's, that's probably what she would say uh, in her more polemical and kind of biting moments. Point number two, she believes very much behind her work is a real sacramental vision of nature and grace. So she writes, Christ didn't redeem us by a direct intellectual act, but became incarnate in human form and he speaks to us now through the mediation of a visible church. This means for the novelist that if he's gonna show the supernatural taking place, he has nowhere to do it except on the literal level of natural events. And again, in one of the most poetic uh, prose phrases of hers, the fiction writer presents mystery through manners, grace through nature. But when he finishes, there always has to be left over that sense of mystery which cannot be accounted for by any human formula. Okay. Most of us have inherited a deeply anti-sacramental vision of reality, where nature, the day-to-day -day living and, and the processes of the world, um, that's all basically largely blind mechanistic process. You know, well, grace comes in as an exception to that natural process. It might come in through the cracks, as it were, of the, of the natural mechanisms. And so we look for enlightenment outside of the day-to-day outside of the stuff that makes up the, the kind of bulk of our lives. But here's Flannery's point. God himself entered the day-to-day -day of our lives. God himself entered the world of dust and blood and food and sweat. And in the sacraments, we continue to encounter God through oil, water, bread, wine, and so forth. And this for Flannery, at least for Flannery, right, this is the faith. This is the normative way by which grace is communicated. Straightforward not in spite of nature, but through it and in it. So this is the drama that the Catholic novelist is most interested in, how mystery erupts in manners and how grace permeates nature. That's in a certain way that the point of, of the Catholic novelist. Okay, and then just a final point, and then I think we're gonna hear from Amy again. Um, so if you'll, if you'll bear with me for another couple minutes, Amy, just to finish out this section. Um, the third one is this, and this is very characteristic of Flannery's works, as you've seen in what you've read for today. She likes to awaken with the grotesque, or you might say even the violent. Okay, that's usually how she refers to it. And she writes about this. 
She says, our age not only does not have a very sharp eye for the almost imperceptible intrusions of grace, it no longer has much feeling for the nature of the violences which precede and follow them. In my own stories, I found that violence is strangely capable of returning my characters to reality and preparing them to accept their moment of grace. Their heads are so hard that nothing else will do the work. This idea that reality is something to which we must be returned to at considerable cost is one which is seldom understood by the casual reader, but it's one which is implicit in the Christian view of the world. And then finally, a good man is hard to find has been called grotesque, but I prefer to call it literal, she says, which is a great, is a great line. So to be honest, this is probably the most difficult aspect of Flannery's work for readers. Okay, upon first glance, this woman is a sadist, right? She's some kind of, she has some fascination with violence. Um, but it, but I, wanna, I wanna make a couple of distinctions immediately, right? It, it's particularly difficult for Northerners. And the reason I say that is because um, her work can be considered part of a larger genre of Southern Gothic or Southern grotesque, where they're used to kind of detailing what's known as the freak or, or that's known as kind of the, the, um, the, the violence that shocks one um, as, as a kind of literary device. And so that's something that in the South is more typical of literary practice. So that's that, and, and we're often not as familiar with that as, as Northerners, the majority of us most likely. But beyond this, Flannery uh, uses violence in a particular way as a Catholic Christian author. She's not just any kind of, uh, you know, Southern grotesque writer. And in that sense, she says herself that violence should never be used for violence's sake, right? It's always has, has another purpose. And there's nothing like torture in her writings. There's nothing like sadism, really, in her writings. Um, and she once quipped that uh, many people die in my stories, but nobody gets hurt. <laughs> Which is a great, it's a, it's a wonderful line. And interestingly, I think she means that not just because there really isn't like torture or anything like that, but also because violence is actually used as a means of accessing the moment of that eruption of grace in one's life, in one's nature. And so many are saved precisely in the face of death. And so the violence is used as a, uh, as, as a propedeutic or, or as actually the, the container or, or the movement of grace. Um, and this is why she loved that scriptural passage, the violent bear it away with reference to uh, the kingdom of God, right? The violent bear it away. So Flannery notes that violence and the threat of death have a way of returning one to reality. It's a shock to the system that awakens one to what really matters in life, instead of just our own pet fictions and projections. And so in this sense, her characters really are a training um, for readers, right? She's often impactful because we know someplace deep within ourselves, we have to face death at some point, and we see these characters doing so, and it's, and it's a lot, right? Um, but she also notes that she's being literal and a realist when she's using this type of violence. So she's not placing people in unusual situations necessarily. I mean, we have lots of serial killers, unfortunately. So um, what she was writing about was a lot more rare when she wrote it than, than today. Um, but here we can say that <clears throat> her use of violence in her fiction is not because of her lack of faith as a, as a Catholic novelist. Um, it's actually because of her tremendous faith. And, and, and here's maybe how you could begin to, to talk about that. She believes that God's grace is operative even in the most horrific moments. So she depicts in her stories the very type of salvific suffering that we look at when we look upon a crucifix. She says somewhere that typically her fiction is made up of stories where the action of God's grace occurs in territory held by the devil. So there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of violent kind of responses. There's going to be a lot of problems, but ultimately grace triumphs in many of her stories, almost all of her stories. In fact, there's, there's always kind of good endings as it were, um, not in like the Disney world kind of sense, but, but in the sense that grace triumphs even here. And if grace can triumph even there, her point is, then, then what have we to fear um, in, in the remainder of our lives? Um, okay, so those are just three brief points, and there's so much more to be said. I mean, we're just scratching the surface, but I think those are three essential things to know when you're sort of approaching Flannery's work. Um, so we'll move on to discussion of a good, uh, a good man is hard to find, um, but first let's go to Amy, uh, who said I think her audio is, is better, and I think she has to run. So Amy, so if you're there, feel free to take the floor. 
I am sorry to uh, mess up the flow here, but no, I no. thank you, Matthew, for having us. Um, New Clairvaux, um, I know a lot of you guys probably don't have our wines, but I hope you guys are enjoying something, either wine or a nice warm cup of tea. Um, and Matt, are you drinking the Abbott's Reserve? This one here? I am. I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, restrain myself from the Abbott's Reserve. Yeah. Yes. So this is, this is a very special wine. This is a blend of Zinfandel and Petite Syrah. The Zinfandel comes from Napa, one of our sister vineyards, and Petite Syrah comes from Vina. And it's a 50-50 blend, and it is in honor of our current abbot, Father Paul Mark Schwann. And so a very special wine. I'm glad you opened that one up first. And, um, and for your next presentation, um, I'm hoping we'll be back and we'll share more wines. If for some of those viewers that would like some new Clairville wines, you can go to our website and order it. Um, you can give us a call to whatever is convenient. And we're doing a free shipping for a case or more, which I know that sounds like a lot of wine, but it's a great friend maker. So you can buy a case and good quality wine lasts a very long time. So uh, keep it in a closet or keep it in your cellar. And um, when you think of a perfect friend for New Clairvaux, um, you'll have that gift ready for them. So I hope you guys enjoy and have fun. And uh, thank you so much for inviting us, Matt. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you. And I realized I didn't mention at all how we sort of made this connection, but I had a friend who was discerning a Trappist vocation, Brother Lewis, you, pr you probably know him, um, but he was out visiting uh, your Abbey. And I remember I looked up the website just to see where he was. And I realized that, of course, St. Bernard's School of Theology and Ministry, St. Bernard is obviously integral to the Trappist order. And so I realized that the, the uh, crest on your bottles of New Clairvaux and on, on everything is very, very similar to our crest at St. Bernard's because we both utilize St. Bernard of Clairvaux's, uh, you know, whatever, sainthood uh, crest or, or whatever. So kind of a neat, a neat thing. So we share a crest and now we share a, um, a mission in these events. So it's a gift. So I, the first thing I thought was, wow, that's a nice crest. And then I realized, you know, it's kind of self-complimentary. So, Okay, so why don't we move into now a discussion of uh, Flannery's work that we all read. And, and here I do want to do some interactive kind of stuff. So I, I have a, some, some ground rules here um, that I put together. And I hope they work, process points, I mean, whatever. Uh, this is really the first time we've done this with such a large group. So here's just a few notes to make things run as smoothly as possible. For any discussion question, I'm gonna throw out a few of them, a good number. Um, I'll typically have time to receive like two or three, that's what I'm thinking, in the time that we have left. And so if you would like to make a comment, here's kind of my idea, is to use the raise your hand button within the Zoom interface. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Bernadette, but I believe you go to participants and you can actually click raise hand um, and that should be a button in there. And then I'll select from those with the raised hands uh, who, who can, uh, you know, engage and unmute themselves and, and kind of speak. So unfortunately, the authority has to be kind of <laughs> hemmed in. Um, and then if you have any questions at all or comments about the story in general or in light of the ongoing discussion, uh, feel free to write them in the chat function during the event session. So I see people are already using the chat function, so feel free to do that. And I'll review the chat periodically and offer comment if possible. And if we have time at the end, maybe we can take some of those questions also. Um, and of course, last but not least, thanks for your participation. So if that sounds good, um, now there, there's, one, there's one point that I wanna make right at the outset here, which is that um, as much as I like doing this and as much as maybe you like doing this too, Flannery warns all of us in her prose writings and in her responses to different people's letters and things. She warns all of us to try to avoid analyzing literature as if it's a cadaver, right? As if it's something that's dead. Uh, literature for her is living. And good literature will retain a mystery character to it, a transcendent character to it, regardless of um, whatever could be expunged through analysis or criticism. So someone, they, she would just get letters over and over again, and, and, and people would say, is the misfit Christ? Is the misfit, uh, you know, Christ? And she'd say, no. Why is the misfit wearing a black hat? Because that's what they do in Georgia. Or why, you know, like all this kind of stuff. And so she's resisting this sort of kind of pinning things down, right? It's kind of an allegorization, I don't know, whatever that word might be. 
um, of the text, right? There's always a kind of excess going on here. And that for her is part and parcel of good literature. So what we come upon tonight will be something that leaves the mystery in place, God willing. And so the, the questions that I have are meant to be a bit open-ended and I'll offer some of my own thoughts on these things as well. So, okay, so with that caveat, we will not treat this as a cadaver to the greatest of our ability. Okay, so I just have two kind of subsections here, plot and characters and then drama and catharsis, if you do think there was a catharsis here. Uh, so the first thing being plot and characters. And the first question I have, if someone asked you, what is this short story about, what would you say? And that's a question I put to you now. What would you say if someone asked you that? Kind of a simple question at first glance, but I think also kind of uh, profound in a way. The silence is deafening. I'm searching for a hand and I see none. I'm gonna call on someone. Liz Gilgis, I'm looking at you. Our hands up. Okay. Uh, okay. Tim, Tim okay. Hansen, is that right, Hansen? Go ahead, please hear. Yep. Yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Kuhner. Yeah, my, uh, my, I, my answer would be it's a, uh, a family trip that ends tragically. They didn't end up in Disney World or wherever they're going in Florida, right? Not, not right. quite. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, Rose. Where'd you put away? I just feel like I'm Here you go, I'm gonna unmute you, Rose, there, if that sounds good. Let me try to unmute you. Rose, I can't, you're, you're muted and I cannot unmute you. Maybe you can do it on your end, perhaps. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Wonderful. Yes, okay. Rose. I have a house. I have a place in Hilton Head, South Carolina, about an hour from there. And I, I go to Savannah for golf and I'm familiar with the area. But to me that this, and I, and I know nothing about Flannery O'Connor, but my feeling from what I read would be that these were, this is the culture of the poor Southern person in a tragedy that happened to them. Beautiful, absolutely, absolutely. And you can kind of see there's different, <clears throat> and, and maybe we can talk about this with the characters, but uh, clearly the grandmother does not think she's from the lower strata of society, right? That's one of the hallmarks of her, that she actually prepares her body just in case they do meet the misfit, <laughs> so that she's dressed well, so that even if someone <laughs> sees her dead in the side of the road, they will know that she's a lady, right? <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. Uh, Marianne, Marianne Cleary, the one in the picture from before. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, can you hear me okay? Am I unmuted? Okay. Uh, I, I'm uh, uh, feeling that the ending, they, they both come to a realization of the gift of grace, um, both on the part of the um, misfit and um, the grandma. I, I think that it, it's remarkable how she does that at the end. It seems tragic, but I think on the positive end of things, on both parts, they come to the realization of the gift of grace. That's really interesting. Marianne, we'll come back to you when we talk about the drama and that last moment and talk about okay. how you think that kind of pans out. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, because I think in some ways, Flannery herself kind of comments about that. And it's always interesting when an author kind of weighs in about some things that uh, her stories, you know, offer some insight into what her stories mean. And then other writers disagree with her about what it means, <laughs> even though she was the author. So that is a contested claim, right? That, that sort of the ending is this conversion moment. So I agree with you, but I, I want to kind of explore as to, as to why. Um, yeah, so Liz Gilgis. Yes, I, I would say that in the beginning, it sounds, it's like an ordinary day and an ordinary family trip and quibbling between the kids and the grandmother. And then it ends in an extraordinary way, a really extraordinary way. So what happens? And there is something that happens. So, and I think that's daily life. Mm. Amen. Amen. That's such a great point. That sacramental view of nature and grace. Yet one of my favorite stories about this is, um, Flannery used to read this a lot, right? You can actually find on YouTube her reading this actually live, which is really cool. I highly recommend it. 
Of course, she's got the thick Southern Georgian accent, but she always says that whenever she would read it to a Southern audience, the first half is just filled with this perfect Southern humor, right? Georgian humor. And so in the South, people would be exploding with laughter for the first half. And then for the second half, they're just sitting there stunned in silence. Like what just happened? Like you totally messed with me, you know, kind of thing. Cause it just takes this turn. So exactly, exactly, yes. And then uh, Charles, how about Charles is the final one. Uh, this is Charles Hughes Huff. He'll be joining us as a full-time faculty member in the fall. So, so welcome Charles. Thank you. And actually, it's, it's Heather who's going to talk. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Heather, excellent. Great to meet you over this medium. Yes. Thank you. Um, we, some of you sort of covered this already, but we were saying that um, it's about a moment of grace. And then a lot of Flannery O'Connor stories, um, people are confronted with the choice that grace offers, which is to accept the reality of uh, what God gives us or to reject it. And in this story, as in a lot of her stories, there are people who go the opposite way. The misfit sees what God offers and rejects it. He says, I'm fine on my own. That's why I don't pray. And the grandmother sort of probably for the first time in her life, you can tell she's not a very nice lady to be around despite how she would describe herself. Um, she sees, uh, God in even the most grotesque person she's ever met, um, recognizing him as her own son at that, at that last moment, like uh, operating in the way that God would have her operate, which is to, to stand in with his love. Beautiful, beautiful. That's, that was incredible. That was incredible, Heather. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so we'll, we'll come back to that as well because just some follow-up questions about how that might be the case, right, to kind of dig into it a little bit. And you're exactly right. I think, I think in some ways, um, <clears throat> when Flannery talks about the plot, right, she, she says that essentially this whole story is built around the duel between the misfit and the grandmother, right? It's like a duel. And of course that comes to the head, that comes to head when um, the two finally meet each other. And the misfit, as it were, makes a beeline for the grandmother right away. It's almost as if it's faded, you know? And so, um, the funny thing about that is that she, Flannery gives this whole encounter or this dual, a kind of Oedipal kind of thing as well going on here, right? In the sense that, uh, what was the story of Oedipus, right? Oedipus, right, the Oracle at Delphi said that you're gonna kill your father and marry your mother or whatever, um, or wed your mother. And he desperately wanted to not allow that to happen. So he did everything in his power to run away from it. And he actually ended up running right into his mother's arms and, and you know, killing his father. And so in a, in a similar fashion here, right, the grandmother desperately does not want to meet the misfit. She's like, I wouldn't take my kids in the same direction as that guy. She's the one that's constantly worried about him. The rest of the family doesn't seem all that concerned. And then, of course, she's the one that leads the car down the road directly to the misfit's path by taking them off on this treasure hunt or, or whatever it might be. And then, of course, even when they encounter the misfit, if you remember, uh, she's the one that blurts out his identity oh no, you're the misfit, right? And so if they had any hope of the misfit just packing up and moving on at that point, well, of course he's gonna have to kill them because now they know who he is. So, um, so on and so forth. So there is this kind of Oedipal shape to it. But yeah, but you could say, and, and what's at stake in this duel um, is exactly, and, and I think this might be a neat way to summarize a lot of what you guys have said with this moment of grace, is that there really are kind of two types of meannesses at work, one in the grandmother and one in, the misfit, right? The misfit is mean in, in the sense of cruelty, right? He's, he's a serial killer, very clearly. But the other type of meanness <clears throat> in the grandmother is that kind of like callous, like self-centeredness, right? She's like such a, I mean, she's just, and a lot of it might be like short-sightedness or whatever, but it's, it's very, very funny. I mean, a lot of the ways that you don't want to be around her, the way that she relates these things. Um, but the balance of each of their meanness is upset right, by the encounter between the two. So it's almost as if that duel, they each stab each other at the same time, as it were. I think that would be one of the claim. And because again, the misfit's whole point is this whole business of balance, right? He's a lot about justice. Jesus upset the balance. And the grandmother has a certain balance to her life as well, where she knows what a lady is. She knows what it means to be dignified, to be a good man. And she calls, uh, you know, the, the, the rest stop guy, good man, so on and so forth. So the balance is upset precisely in that moment uh, of encounter. 
Um, so there's a lot going on underneath the surface here. I guess that would be the point that you have the basic plot of, yeah, it's a family going on a, on a vacation trip and then they all get murdered. But, right, there's a whole deeper level here with that kind of sacramental view of nature and grace. Okay, awesome. So let's, let's go on because we can kind of get to uh, other interesting features. So just about the characters real fast. Um, sorry, I should go forward here. Uh, this is the, the monkey, a great illustration of the monkey, of course. We can't forget him in the cast of characters. Uh, who are the main characters and how would you describe them? And then which characters play the most essential role in the drama? So anyone that wants to add something, I mean, maybe particularly I can just give away the ending for the sake of time, but maybe we can jump right to this question of um, who is the grandmother and who is the misfit as characters, right? How would you describe them? I'm seeing some. Um, Suzanne, why don't we go with you and then we'll go to Tricia. That's fine. Um, you know, I, I obviously the central character is the grandmother <clears throat> who hijacked the whole trip and got them all killed. Um, and she plays an essential role though, because in cahoots with the kids, she, th th this is a family run by a man and a woman. And they were totally cowed by these, um, you know, the childlike personalities of their mother and their children. And I thought it was interesting that this was juxtaposed or actually coincident with the childlike personality of the misfit. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he was apparently a hardened criminal. But in this um, tableau, he had a very childlike um presentation you know not, not he wasn't he wasn't playing when he was in this scenario which is what flannery o'connor got at and people were talking a lot about grace and um you know i think different opportunities were presented to these different central people uh, never mind the kids because we know how they act but the, the grandmother who should have been a mature person and the misfit who should have been a mature person were were acting like children and they they pretty much hijacked the lives of all the people around them in this scenario and i was wondering you know what you would say about that given that flannery o'connor was was really close to the vision of christ you know bringing the little children unto me within this um you know discussion about grace so i was just curious what people would say about that that's a really good point that's a really good point and of course the misfit um that's one of the, the key parts there is that he's, he's uncomfortable, right, w around the children. The children make him un unstable or uncertain, right? So what, what is it maybe about children that unsettle him, you know? Uh, whereas Jesus, of course, said, let the children come unto me. So there's a sort of juxtaposition there. But you're so right that he sort of also is kind of childish, right? But also kind of childlike. So any thoughts on that point before we move on? Okay, we have Adriana. Hi, how are you? Very good, <laughs> welcome. Everybody, thank you. I'm ex really enjoying this. This is the very first time I've ever attended this and I'm so thrilled to, to be part of this. I, the, the main characters uh, are the misfit and the grandmother. But one of the things that I found rather interesting is that both of them seem to agree that he is a good man. He, what he does is he says the thing he's been wronged, but he knows, or he knows that he's a good man. What she does to try to get him to understand that he's a good man is, you know, she, she turns to, to her faith, but is her faith truly speaking about him being a good man or did, or is he seeing that she's just using words? So to me, that was what I was thinking about while I was reading that. Um, to me, I thought these were the very interesting characters and the, the dialogue between both of them were ra was rather interesting as well. <clears throat> yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. 
No, it's so true. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Joseph. Oh, hi. I would say the same way. It's the misfit and the grandmother, the main characters. The thing with the misfit is he understands who he is. And that's the issue for all of us is knowing who you are. So the misfit knows that he does what he does, but he doesn't ever repent of his failings. So he kind of reminds me of the centurion in the New Testament. Mm. He's not a good man, and the centurion soldier does what he has to do, but he understood something about himself, and he had enough humility to come to Christ and ask for help, unlike the misfit. Mm -hmm. The grandmother mm -hmm. is just the opposite. She thinks she knows who she is, but she doesn't really know it. And so we see in the end, uh, judgment by the misfit is given. So her lack of humility uh, sort of stands out for me. And that is, I think, for all of us, humility is the key, because all of mm -hmm. us have play feet. And I think that's what the story tries to tell us. And that's how I see it. That's really helpful, Joseph. Thank you so much for that. Yes, because, and that kind of picks up on the, the previous comment, right, in the sense that um, I think that probably is true that of all the characters, the misfit is the one with the deepest grasp upon who they are. The grandmother, again, thinks that she knows, right? Um, but the misfit, uh, yeah, and, and Flannery even comments along, along these lines, right, that the misfit, the way that uh, the misfit behaves, he clearly has the most potency for grace, right, because he he sees clearly, and we'll talk about this in a little bit as well, but he sees clearly what's at stake, even if he behaves in ways that are, um, you know, whatever, opposed to the Christian message to, and to Jesus Christ, let's put it this way. Um, but you're so right, and I think that is a deep theme, is who are each of these characters, right? Their identity. Um, within that general search as to whether there is a good man, right? Is there a good man found in this story? There's also just that general question of who these characters are. So for example, um, did you notice Bailey's wife is almost never referred to as Bailey's wife, just wife, just the children's mother. There's no name. And it's the same thing with Red Sammy, right? Red Sammy Butts, he, he does, his wife does not have a name, so on and so forth. So there's a kind of um, lack of, of presencing and lack of personal agency on the part of a lot of these characters. And, and that's sort of an important feature of, I think the story is that they're all kind of moving towards uh, some sense of knowing who they are. And, and Flannery does mention at one point that she leaves it open that in fact, going into the woods, as it were, was an opportunity of grace for all the characters, right? Not just uh, the grandmother, so to speak, in that moment. So yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, Trisha, did you have a comment on the characters? Um, I was just gonna say that the grandmother, you know, in the beginning, she's very controlling over the situation, you know, over her grandchildren, over her son. And, um, but it was, it was a caring controlling. And then she brought that same caring controlling over the misfit in trying to tell him and that he's a good person and accompanying him in finding his own grace. So it wasn't, it's not a controlling in a negative manner, but it's a controlling and a loving, caring, godlike manner. You know, that you're taking the wrong path, you're going down the wrong road, let me try to help you. Even if she lacks the humility to think, well, maybe I'm wrong with what I, I personally see, right? Exactly. Well, exactly. And, I, and I agree with that, you know, her lack of humility and you see where she kind of says, oh, it was, the house was in Tennessee, like she realized her mistake yeah. when it all came to fruition. And I mean, didn't, you know, confess it, but she kind of came to with her own grace in that point saying, look at what I've done and what has happened. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. So something, something funny happened. Um, Flannery received a letter from a northern uh, 
English professor from the Northeast, I think someplace, and said, you know, all of my students agree that the grandmother is just a witch, right? She's got the hat, she's got the cat, she's a witch. And Flannery wrote back and said, you know, I'm so sorry, but here in the South, nobody has ever had that interpretation because any Southerner would see their own grandmother in this grandmother, right? <laughs> so there's something about the Southern grandmother, exactly as you say that a lot of this can be completely out of love. It might be, again, nearsighted or short-sighted love, but, but there is a certain care there, right? And even if it be misplaced, like for example, when she wants to take the cat with, so that the cat isn't home alone for three days, brush up against the gas stove and asphyxiate himself. My first question was, well, what about the house? Like the house could like right, burn down, but okay, so you get sort of misplaced attention on the cat, like whatever, but, but no, but exactly. So thank you for that defense of the grandmother. She needs to be defended, you know, sometimes, so. Now, what about, so the misfit, the misfit really strikes me. Uh, he's also very, Okay, so let's put it this way. The grandmother is also on a search throughout this story. She's on a search for, frankly, um, the nobility of the South, you might say. And there's a number of different things that like, we can't really go into in terms of depth, but um, their whole journey is, as it were, a who's who of her kind of looking back on better times. Um, there's a lot of indications that uh, Flannery and the grandmother are sort of shadowingly critiquing the direction that the South is taking, kind of turning away from agrarian life and moving towards more industrial life, such as when, um, when uh, Wesley replaces his sister's view of the cloud as a cow with his, her, his view as an automobile, right? So the cow is replaced by the automobile. A lot of these different things have a lot of significance in that regard. Um, the stone mountain that they pass at one point on the trip is actually that stone mountain was famous because it was the KKK meeting site and it had a lot of role within the Confederacy. So as it were, you're sort of driving through the South almost. Um, th that Stone Mountain would not have been on the route to Florida, right? It's, it's just a literary device that it's being used by her. So she's on the, on the search, right, for true Southern nobility, you might say. And the irony is that in some ways she finds it in the misfit, right? The misfit is always, he has like the best manners, right? He says, oh, ma'am, you know, like using the ma'am words and all this kind of stuff, right? In some ways, he's the true Southern gentleman. He has class, which is something that you don't necessarily expect to find, right? He apologizes, right, for being shirtless, I think, at one point, you know, this whole kind of thing. So, um, so it's this irony where he actually presents himself and he looks like a scholar with his glasses, right? So, so he is not who you might expect him to be as it were. And so in that sense, it makes his character that much more dynamic, I think, when it comes to the fact that he, he is the one sort of um, uh, orchestrating these killings at least. But notice he only personally executes the grandmother, which is kind of interesting. So thoughts on that. I mean, I just, I love the Misfits character, to be honest. And Ralph Wood, you know, again, my hero, he, he says, look, the notion that a Georgian serial killer could actually put so perfectly um, such a Nietzschean argument at the end, you know, in perfect Georgian accent, but say, well, then Christ shouldn't have come, you know, or whatever, right? He shouldn't have done it, upset the balance. He just gets no end of joy out of that to hear Nietzsche in Georgian accent. Uh, so, <laughs> any further thoughts on the misfit? Uh, Liz Tisalona. Hi. Uh yeah, so I like The Misfit as well, and I'm very hopeful for The Misfit. And I think uh, um, he, he really got it when he said that if he did what he said, then it's nothing for you to do but throw away everything and follow him. So he was referring to what Jesus did, dying on the cross for everybody. So I'm really hopeful for him. Like he, he's done a lot of bad things, killing people. and um, but. But it's also um, uh, it, him knowing that uh, I, I, I have hope for him that someday he will finally figure out and follow Jesus. So yeah, so I kind of like sad, but really happy for him too that, oh, he got it. So um, yeah. Amen, sister, me too, me too. Absolutely. No, there really is a lot of hope with him, isn't there? I mean, when have you seen sort of the heart of the gospel put in such nugget form 
um, especially in the mouth of a serial killer in that way. I mean, it really is put so starkly and so clearly and you just say, yes. And then the interesting part, of course, right, is that um, <laughs> right at the end, he actually says that the very thing that you should be doing, aside from throwing everything away and following Christ, is no longer pleasant for him. Right, that's sort of the last line, right? And then, there ain't no pleasure in it, right, at the end. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. So where does that leave the misfit at the end? And I think you're right to be hopeful. I think Flannery herself was hopeful when she sort of put herself in her reader's shoes. So... Uh, Liz Gilgis. It's actually Kent. Um, I was going to just comment. My, my read of it is a little bit different. That uh, the, the imagery that I see in The Misfit is, to me, very sort of reminiscent of Lucifer. Uh, that that you, you have the picture of his uh, scapula, his uh, shoulder blades, and how... how um, thin they are and how uh, almost frail and, and it's almost like stunted wings. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you have the picture of his, um, his bright smile, that there's, there's sort of a beauty there, but it's, it's a hideous beauty because he's twisted. Uh, and, and to me, uh, the, the whole crux of this story is, the the uh, a family in the south and the grandmother running into Lucifer, and having a, a theological conversation with Lucifer, where you aren't going to change his mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. So there's um, just to pick up on that because I think she also sees the misfit in that way. Uh, she put at the head, so, so A Good Man is Hard to Find is both the title of this short story and is also the title of an early collection of her short stories. And I believe A Good Man is Hard to Find as an individual story was put at the very beginning of that collection. But the epigraph at the beginning of that collection is a, a quote from St. Cyril of Jerusalem that said essentially our path to glory um, is through facing the dragon on the side of the road. And in some ways a lot of commentators say that that is the story precisely of a good man is hard to find, that they are essentially encountering the dragon on the side of the road. That is the access to uh, the, the ever beyond, as it were, you know, in that sense. So I think, yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. And there's also a lot of people pick up on the, um, the anti-trinity, as it were, of Hiram, Bobby Lee, and uh, uh, the misfit. And I tend to think also, and this is just me sort of extrapolating, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the image of Rublev's Trinity. It's this ancient image with the three kind of sitting around, the three in, in angelic form, but it's Father, Son, and Spirit. And it's, it's supposed to be the moment that they make the decision to take action in the incarnation and the whole plan of salvation for humankind. And uh, I, I was sort of doing some research in it, and, and there are ways in which the colors of their clothes when they're first introduced, that is Bobby Lee Hiram and the Misfit, sort of match up, right? In the sense that for Rublev, the Christ figure, the, the, the center of them is the one who has um, the lightest color chest, almost like a bare chest, because he reveals the heart of the father, right? So there's this certain revelatory act there. And of course, the Misfit without the shirt on, so on and so forth. So there is sort of this anti-Trinitarian uh, thing. Now, on the other hand, um, Flannery left direct ambivalence because if you notice in some of the interplay in the dialogue, this is, this is just how deep the story goes, in some of the interplay in the dialogue, you really can't tell sometimes if she's, she almost sounds like she's referring to the misfit as Jesus in the actual dialogue at the end. It's, it's sort of very curious and a lot of people kind of pick up on this. Um, so yeah, th so there's a lot of questions there, but Flannery herself said that she hopes that the, the gesture of the grandmother will um, lodge in the misfit's heart and grow like that which grows from a mustard seed and, and redeem him. Uh, she calls him the spoiled prophet, as it were. She, he had all of, the, all of the might and all of the possibility of a prophet, um, but he's gone down a different path. And so that kind of fits with the Lucifer, right? Because he was an angel of light and, and took a different path. So, awesome. Excuse me, Dr. Kuhner? Yes, please, Daniel. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I just wasn't sure. Do you know how to, um, do, you, do you know how to, how we should comment? What do we need to do again to comment? 
Oh, absolutely. So you can comment now if you like, but you can also hit the chat button um, in the controls. Okay. And you should be able, yeah, exactly. So you can hit the chat button and just type it in there if you like. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Perfect. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom? Yes. Uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm a slow reader, but I, when I read it, uh, you might say uh, if I hadn't heard uh, some of the meanings of the ending, that w I, I'm not sure I would have come up with all that, um, you know, the explanations in my mind of the symbolism. She's, she's very famous for symbolism. But um, as I read it, uh, you know, her skill as a writer, she was able to, just with a few words, to um, define the character of the, uh, I, I see her as a manipulative mother-in-law, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and so, you know, thinking, self-centered, thinking about herself. And um, so, you know, she even tries to manipulate the killer I see him as as um, in denial as well about his his real character, because you know he said something about when he was in prison he he didn't know what he did wrong, yeah, and and so a, a serial killer a psychopathic killer doesn't doesn't realize their guilt, mm -hmm. but she I don't know I don't understand why she suddenly saw him as her son. And she, she's giving him some tenderness that he's fearful of. And maybe that, that, that's uh, touching on um, what, he, what is hard for him to take. I, I don't know, that's, that's what I see. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe, so why don't we go there now, if that sounds good. Why don't we go to that final moment? Because uh, I do have my eye on the time. I don't want to push us over too far. But Let's go to that final moment and maybe we can ask, for example, um, Heather and Marianne to kind of speak more about what they mean when they talk about this moment of grace uh, that, that they're encountering. Um, sorry, I don't want to zoom in on the monkey. Um, but let's go, let's go now to the drama and cathars. We talked about this a little bit already. How would you describe the dialogue between the misfit and the grandmother? What does this dialogue reveal about their respective relationships with God? and with their faith. Um, one additional comment on that, just before we move to that, to the final moment. Um, what's interesting about the grandmother is she's, she's saying to him, pray, 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 right? All this kind of stuff. But she also drops her faith like, like a, a, a wet worm or something right at the end, right? Where she is trying to, she does, at least on my count, four different arguments to the misfit to get him not to kill her, right? First, you know, you wouldn't shoot a lady, right? And, that, and then that repeats and repeats and repeats. Okay, even though her hat breaks, you notice that. So it's sort of like a, the brokenness of, of the grandmother is already presaged in the breaking of the hat. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, he's a good man. Again, trying to sort of put this upon him and saying, you're a good man. You're clearly not from common stock, you know, that kind of thing, right? Um, and then um, she says, I'll give you all the money I've got. Okay, so there's that the sort of typical thing. And then finally, she, you know, he basically says, well, I wasn't there to see Jesus rise. He rose, he upset everything. So now all you do is throw away your life or you just kill people. And she says, well, maybe he didn't rise, right? <laughs> and just sort of chucks that all away. So at least like, you know, Ralph Wood and others, they, they call her a sort of practical atheist, right? Where, um, you know, for, for more or less, you know, nominal reasons, she calls herself a Christian, but, but maybe doesn't. Uh, have that faith. And, and on some readings, it's, it's the misfit who in a certain way understands the faith better than the grandmother, uh, which is interesting. So just to say that uh, for, for that question, but let's go on. So maybe what we can do is um, we can do maybe a little slow reading of this final moment here. Uh, the peak of the drama occurs in the final moments of the grandmother's life. What happens in this moment of clarity and of violence? Um, so let's just, let me just read through this here. Um, so the misfit says, we'll start about halfway down the page on uh, 132, if, if you're working with the same that I am. It's the second to last page of the story. Paragraph begins with, I wasn't there, so I can't say he didn't. I wasn't there, so I can't say he didn't, the misfit said. I wished I had have been there, he said, hitting the ground with his fist. It ain't right I wasn't there, because if I had been there, then I would have known. 
Listen, lady, he said in a high voice, if I'd have been there, I would have known and I wouldn't be like I am now. His voice seemed about to crack and the grandmother's head cleared for an instant. She saw the man's face twisted close to her own as if he was going to cry and she murmured, why you're one of my babies, you're one of my own children. She reached out and touched him on the shoulder. The misfit sprang back as if a snake had bitten him and shot her three times through the chest. Then he put his gun down on the ground, took off his glasses and began to clean them. Hiram and Bobby Lee returned from the woods and stood over the ditch, looking down at the grandmother who sat, who half sat and half lay in a puddle of blood with her legs crossed under her like a child's and her face smiling up at the cloudless sky. Without his glasses, the misfit's eyes were red rimmed and pale and defenseless looking. Take her off and throw her where you've thrown the others, he said, picking up the cat that was rubbing itself against his leg. She was a talker, wasn't she? Bobby Lee said, sliding down the ditch with a yodel. She would have been a good woman, the misfit said, if it had been someone there to shoot her every minute of her life. Some fun, Bobby Lee said. Shut up, Bobby Lee, the misfit said. It's no real pleasure in life. Fantastic. And of course, the part just before uh, where I started to read was when he concludes his theological excursus and he says, no pleasure but meanness, right? No pleasure but meanness. And then he appears to reverse that in that last line. Um, okay, so what, what in the world is going on here? And, and there is a lot of sort of mystery, depth, ambivalence. So it's not like there is a, you know, multiple choice answer and only one is necessarily correct in this. But what what is your guys read on this and then i'll give i'll give uh, mine as well but i want to hear your thoughts on this so what's happening what what changes or or what a brings to light for the grandmother this moment of clarity and and why and what is that moment and then maybe b why does the misfit react uh like a snake bite right why does he do that can we answer yeah sure my feeling is then is now that we don't know what the background of this misfit is. And if you're a teacher, you know that some children react, and in his case, he's an adult, and they don't want to be touched. It seemed he went from being manipulated by the grandmother to do like um, a mediator would be to calm him down, to bring him around, not to shoot her. And... Um, she went ahead and touched him and that just triggered something from his life that had him react the way he did. That's it. That's wonderful. Absolutely. And because he's, he's very, I mean, let's just say this, right? He's very independent minded, right? He doesn't need any help from anyone. He wants to do it all himself. So for him to be put in the position of a child, uh, that that goes against the grain of everything he is. It seems if, uh, he is averse to sonship. Right, if, period to, to play on that Lucifer uh, well, kind of image. Where he lives, I I would believe that in that section of of there are the very very poor that live in shacks. I'm talking about shacks, and then you have these palatial mansions and gorgeous places to live, such as Flannerly lived. Mm. So Amen. Yeah. the rich and the poor. And right. so it's to me, he's one of the downtrodden mm -hmm. sociopaths. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Uh, Deacon Tim. So I, at, at the point where he said, I've been there, I would not be, you know, if I would have known, it made me think of him as like Doubting Thomas. You know, he wasn't there. He didn't get to see, so he didn't believe it. And even when the apostles came and said, but, but he was there, but he was here, we saw him. And he still doubted, he recoiled like Thomas recalled, saying, hey, unless I touch the hand, if you put my hands in his side and, and see it, I won't believe. So it's almost like this, the woman was trying to say, uh, you know, come against what he was saying, but he was saying, no, I won't believe unless I see it. And he, everything was what, he saw what he believed. And that takes him all the way back to the beginning of, you know, I can't remember what I did wrong mm -hmm. and how I got there. So, you know, what did I do wrong? And, and so it was this belief of not experiencing it himself and, and not remembering and forgetting. So he, he kind of reminded me of Doubting Thomas at that moment. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And to, so to carry that out further then to build on that, um, it seems like Heather, uh, sorry, not to put you on the spot, but it seemed like Heather, you were suggesting earlier that in a certain way, the grandmother affected that real encounter that he almost wished that he had. Is that right? Do, do you want to follow up on that? Almost as if this was Christ reaching out and, and touching him at this moment. Yeah, I think they sort of both function that way for each other. She has spent her life trying to think she's good enough because she's a lady and she doesn't recognize um, what grace demands as far as like humility and pure gift. Um, and even to the very last, she says he, <laughs> maybe he didn't raise the dead. Like she's willing to give it all up if she can avoid right. this uh, decision she has to make. But in the end, she's confronted through the fear of loss of her life to see um, the love of God and to become its agent. And then for him, he's sort of presented with the same choice. Um, he, I love the Lucifer connections. He sees with his eyes open the choice that life offers, which is to accept God and to follow him and to give up everything that you are in that pursuit or to reject it and to accept only what you are as the end of your being basically. Um, and so her free gift of love in the face of violence presents him with that choice again. And he, I agree, he stands with his original decision, which is to reject it and to say that, yeah, it's no real pleasure in life. This is all that life is. It's meanness or nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so let me, let me offer that. That was beautifully put. And I think, I think that's absolutely, that completely matches with mine, except maybe putting a twist with the misfit to maybe push on that a little bit in the sense that, um, you do have all these kind of symbolisms at play here. So for example, the, the blood, someone used the centurion example, right, of, of the one who pierces Christ and the blood, right, Longinus is the, is the old story, right, where Longinus was that, that centurion that pierced Christ's side and the blood flowed down the spear and into his eyes and healed his blindness. Okay, so what you have here in, in a certain interesting way is the blood of the grandmother splattering onto the glasses of the misfit. Right. And he puts his gun down. So it could be taken. Okay, fine. And now he does wipe the blood off, which is sort of interesting. Right? It's just like, get, the, get this away from me. Um, but, but he does, you know, have this defenseless look about him right after that moment, which is sort of interesting. And what's also curious is that instead of picking up his gun, he picks up the grandmother's cat. Um, which is sort of weird, right? But I think the cat, the cat represents... And, and maybe this sort of bleeds over into the grandmother, but the cat represents the only other time in the story where the grandmother is truly charitable towards anything. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> when she cares about the cat being asphyxiated. So it's almost as if now, instead of carrying the gun, he's carrying the grandmother's charity, right? I mean, that, that's sort of one way to, to kind of read it. And so in this sense, it's no real pleasure in life. So in other words, he's not there yet about reversing his, his kind of approach, but all of a sudden what's happened is He's saying earlier on, there's no pleasure but meanness, which means meanness is the only pleasure in life, right? And now he's saying that the, what he took to be the only pleasure in life, that pleasure has now been taken from me. And so I have nothing left. And so he's thrown back in that original moment of decision, as it were, carrying this annoying cat um, with, with this, this kind of encounter. So that's, that's one sort of uh, counter narrative maybe, but. That's, yeah, that's a fair reading. That's funny. That's yeah, super cool. Okay, I think Mrs. Lachlan had a comment. Uh, our, our, the, the first lady of St. Bernard's has a comment. Go. Yeah. Okay, Matthew, I've been listening to all the comments and um, I have, some of it is very, very interesting and stimulated thought in a different direction. But my primary thought was this misfit expressed very, very clearly that had he been there to see Christ, risen and like Thomas touched the wounds and so forth, he would not be who he is today. He is a psychopath because of all of the killings. He's been involved in evil for quite some time. So it has altered his character. But this woman who did not react to the death of her son and your grandson, her daughter-in-law and daughter in a, in a fashion that one would expect was always concerned with her own safety and manipulating 
circumstance. And her dialogue with him was always very, um, what we could call preachy. She was trying to get him with Jesus talk. Now this man listened to her, but as my husband pointed out, which is really, really great, it wasn't until she ejaculated something very real from her heart, not her control and her safety, but something real, her child. You're like one of my babies. And she touched him. And he recoiled from that because he recoiled from Christ. He was so far gone in evil that he had passed that point and he did not, he was bored with her. And so he killed her and then cleaned his glasses very carefully after. That's one thing I wanted to comment on. And another thing that revealed to me in the whole dialogue between them was how many Christians actually take it so seriously that they would change as the misfit pointed out. If I believe in him, then I have to follow him or I choose evil. Whether he was satanic or not, but he put the, he put the position out there. And we in this day and age suffer from that lack of commitment in many levels. And I think that's what Flannery was just putting it all out there for everyone to view. And those who can see it, see it. It's like you're either in with Christ and you listen to him and you live accordingly, which is the book of Acts. All of us, the readings of the church right now are the book of Acts. And what happened in the book of Acts? People actually converted and gave all of their being to Christ. They changed. And we're in this middle of the road thing that's taken centuries to get us here. But here we are. And God is giving us another siren call. You know, all the artists and everybody are pointing. We have to make up our mind. Are we all in? Or are we just going to be kind of like psh, middle way? And what did Christ say at the end? I will spit you out of my mouth. I never knew you. I think that's kind of there. Okay, sorry. Amen, Ms. Long, that's so beautiful. And you know, one of the, um, everyone has to agree because she's the, the first lady. So no one can take issue with anything she says. No, just kidding. Um, so it, it reminds me of something that Flannery said. She said that um, sentimentality is to Christianity like pornography is to art. It's really interesting, really interesting. Um, the kind of cheapness of it almost, um, the kind of abuse there. But that's so true. And, and I see we have a comment that kind of um, merges with this. You know, do you think the characters are meant to be Catholic? And what's interesting is Flannery is writing in the South and the majority of the South is like the Bible Belt, at least where she is. And so she's really a Catholic writer writing in the evangelical Protestant South. So the majority of her, I think, save for one short story or maybe two short stories, most of the characters are not Catholic. Um, I think there's, there's one story, I forget what it is, it's something Holy Spirit, right? Um, where there, there's the Catholic schoolgirls, I think, are some of the main characters. But other than that, it's mostly Protestant folks. And she has no end of kind of generating the same kind of critique. So if she has two kind of typical characters, one being kind of like the, the prophet slash freaks, kind of like the misfit, right? The other type of character that she has is the lukewarm Christian that Mrs. Lachlan is kind of calling out. And she excoriated Catholics along those lines uh, just as much as anyone else. But nevertheless, you're exactly right, Mrs. Lachlan, this is something you see in Flannery is um, that she adopted herself this view that it's all or nothing, right? So the misfit's not wrong. The misfit's not wrong. And that's, and that's sort of important to, to understand. So no, she did not think that all these characters were Catholic, um, but she just thought Christianity across the board needed to stay away from a sentimentalization or, or something like that, you know, to, so that that kind of nihilism or Christianity viewpoint could be seen fully. Um, Teresa, I think you had your hand up there a, a bit back. I'm so sorry for missing it. No, that's okay. Um, you know, I think one of the things that struck me when I first read Flannery, when I took your class was like, I read her and I was like, how is she Catholic? <laughs> Um, it, because her stuff doesn't read that way, but, um, she is very blunt about showing 
all sides of humanity in her characters you know some of the characters and, and one character can show a good side of humanity and and show the bad side of humanity at another point and at the end of there you know i think her realization was the realization that you know this is wh who i should have been all along in this in this moment realizing looking at him as her child that was like the light bulb going off for her and he recoiled from that because maybe it was he'd never experienced anybody trying to connect with him that way and maybe that's his saying if i had been there when christ you know was crucified and, and was raised then my life would have been different well, she was being that person in that moment for him and reaching out to him and, and in that moment treating him as a human being. But he recoiled from it and he killed her. <laughs> but then at the end, the last line, like you said before, I, I don't think he was there yet. But the fact that he said there's no pleasure in this shows that it made an impression for me it made an impression on him that you know maybe what i've been doing all my life and yes i have all the these excuses for it but maybe i really have not been leading my life the way i should have been mm. amen that's so beautiful that's so beautiful absolutely absolutely and the grandmother you know when um flannery comments in this moment she does say that uh, the way that she puts it is the misfit recoiled from this act of humanness, mm -hmm. right, on the part of the, the grandmother. So you're so right. And, and picking up on what Ms. Lachlan was saying, you know, that this is a moment of authenticity for her, right? Her mind had claritas and, and clarity. Absolutely. Um, Lee Household, I see. Yes. <laughs> uh, good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm really enjoying all of this. It's nice to be able, especially in a rural area where we're closed in here, we don't get to see very many people. Mm -hmm. uh, reading the story, I kind of felt, uh, and I'm gonna jump track a little bit here, is I was really, um, I, with, the, with the boys being taken off and going into the woods, there was no, they didn't struggle to get away from that. They were just taken into the woods. So that would be exit stage right and then the exit stage left was the girls. They came up and they went without the struggle. It was almost like the lambs to slaughter and mm -hmm. didn't do anything to, to get out of the situation. So center stage was the grandmother and the misfit. And that center stage to me kind of struck as it's a center stage between God and us, and between the almost checking in on ourselves to see where we stand with God. And the misfit was going through everything. He's almost answering his own questions. And she was just bringing everything forth, bringing it forward. And then in the end, he just said, eh, you know, eh, I am who I am because of what has happened. I just, it kind of struck a chord to me again, that those two, that the, the sons and the daughters just went off. And there was no, they didn't fight it at all. The, the children's mother didn't, um, the misfit asked her, says, uh, would you go off to where your husband was taken into the woods? And she says, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> exactly, exactly, yes. I yes. know. So um, why don't we do one more comment and then we'll kind of uh, wrap it up for the evening. I think Patty D uh, has her hand up. Hi everyone. Um, I happened to read this book over the last few weeks, just purely by chance. Um, and then coincidentally heard about this tonight from Liz. Um, so I, like you said earlier, I would read one story and kind of let it resonate and think about it and a couple days later I'd pick it up and read one more short story out of this 10 um, in this particular 
expedition. And I'm so struck by her abruptness and her um, kind of shocking uh, things that happen. And I was so struck by the fact that it, it didn't seem um, that she was trying to promote her Catholicism or it, it was just very interesting to me in the in this book and in, in this story. Um, but I also wanted to speak about how many of her other stories were, I was thinking that it was very um, based on the like mystery of her faith or the mystery of faith in general, because um, the, the characters would do something and you'd be so surprised. It was so abrupt. It was so... Um, surprising and then it was almost like they were jolted into reality or thinking about their um i guess their existence or whatever their circumstance was or so many of the characters were women trying to hold things together it was just very interesting to me i I'm, I'm really grateful i had a chance to jump in here so i don't really have a comment other than Perhaps she was trying to talk about the mystery of faith. That's all. Amen, Patty. Oh my gosh, I couldn't agree more. That's so true, right? It's not like direct proselytization or something like that, where she's kind of trumpeting that she's just pressing into the depths. And, and that's part of like, I guess, the depth of her faith is that she really believes that if you press into those existential places, you're going to get to Christ, right? You're going to get there um, eventually. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Yes. And, and I love, I would love to talk more about her other stories as well. So if, if my turn comes up again on Words with Wine, we'll probably do another one. My favorites are uh, Revelation and uh, Parker's Back uh, also. So I don't know, those are, those are later though. So um, wonderful guys, this is, this is such a blessing, this conversation. And I just have, I guess, one question to leave you guys with that we didn't really get to. I think it's been implicit in a lot of this. But the question is this, um, if a good man is hard to find, get off my screen here. Was one found in O'Connor's short story? It was a human, right? And I'll, I'll give away, I mean, it's just something to reflect upon as like a takeaway. I mean, my take would be no, and I think she might have in mind here uh, the scriptural passage, you know, call no man good, right? except your heavenly father, that, that sort of thing, because we find that uh, everyone who thinks or says that they're a, a good person or a good man in the story um, actually has these flaws. And so we all could kind of find ourselves in each of these characters in, in different ways. Um, so wonderful. All right, guys, this is a great gift. Thank you so much for coming out. And um, again, the next one I think will be, is it June 16th, Bernadette? It's June 18th. June 18th. Perfect. And that will be led by our very own Dr. Lachlan. Dr. Lachlan, do you want to give a plug for this? Speak a little more to it? Oh, sweet Jesus. Um, um, basically, the thesis of what I want to do next time is to look at music um, in a way in which is rather different from the way in which people typically look at it. Many people look at music just simply from the perspective of beat, rhythm, uh, texture, uh, timbre, all those sorts of things. But there's a transcendental aspect to the whole of music that if properly and contemplative, contemplatively approached, yields up so much beauty and so much goodness. And so I, I'm gonna choose five particular uh, topics, um, uh, line, verticality, um, and uh, I don't have it before me right now, but there are a number of things that I would like to talk about uh, that will be able uh, to open up uh, not just music, but the whole of art um, to the understanding that we have of, uh, of eternal things. Oh, that's about the best I can do right now, Matthew. <laughs> Love, it. Love it. Thank you so much. It's after glasses of wine, after the misfits come through, it's, it's difficult, you know. All right, thank you guys so much. You'll be receiving a follow-up email um, with some links. I might even include a link if I can to this Prezi. So that would be a, a nice thing as well. So um, thank you all so much for coming out. And yeah, we'll be in touch. God bless you.